Okay, once again, thanks everyone for joining, whether it's your morning, your afternoon, or your evening. Thank you for joining this uh, QED webinar, Quality of Experience Delivered webinar. Uh, it takes part of uh, uh, what we call our knowledge based series of webinars, which is really to focus in on some of the key areas of work uh, that the Broadband Forum is doing, as well as some key areas of development and of interest to the industry and the broadband ecosystem in general. Uh, as I said, this is um, this is actually the first of two knowledge-based webinars that's going to be based around quality of experience delivered. Uh, the focus of today's webinar is why, with the ever-increasing amounts of bandwidth to residential and business users, is that not the only consideration in delivering the right user and application experience across the board? We will be going into a deeper dive and a, a deeper technical dive uh, in a following webinar, which is scheduled for March the 3rd. But let's get ahead with the, uh, the webinar we have in practice for today. And uh, I'll be your moderator, Craig Thomas from the Broadband Forum. And I'm really lucky to be joined by uh, an illustrious group of experts from the service provider and vendor community. And each one of these uh, gentlemen and panelists uh, represent organizations that are all major contributors to our broadband forum work in general and specifically within the QED project itself. First of all, we have uh, Magnus Olden, uh, who's the CTO of Domos, and he's been optimizing our uh, Wi Fi for user experience as opposed to just megabits per second for well over the last five years. Uh, then we have Gavin Young, who, uh, if you don't know Gavin, is responsible and leads all of the work within the Vodafone Group for their fixed broadband access technology strategy, architecture, vendor community, and standards. Uh, then we're lucky to be joined by Peter Thompson, uh, who is responsible within PNSOL uh, for all of their customer facing projects and directs their PR and marketing activity. Uh, and definitely not last but least, we have Rudy Hernandez. Uh, who has a long history in tier one service providers uh, such as AT&T and with Inspirant uh, he shows the value of active assurance tools. So looking at the uh, the agenda I'm lucky that they've taken all of the responsibility from the moderator away and they're doing a great tag team effort here uh, to look at what is an introduction to QED and why now is the time to shift from speed to user experience. Then we're going to go into a lot more detail around demand implications and benefits for a service provider, including all of that long list of information. And then finally, we will hopefully have time for Q&A. And just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you do have questions for our panelists, please can you enter that in the Q&A section of this Zoom call that you can find at the bottom of the screen if you have it, hover your cursor over that. And just for your information, we will be recording this session and be making the recording as well as a PDF of the slides available to you post event. So on that note, I'd like to pass over to Magnus. Over to you, Magnus. Magnus, you're on mute, my friend. Magnus, there, yes. very there we go. <laughs> you see, when you gave me control of the screen, the unmute button went away. Ah, well, I'm glad we can hear you now. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to, well, first of all, thank Craig and the BBF for having us. And uh, I'm going to start with this, which, which I think is a uncontroversial opinion that uh, what an operator should be doing is try to provide the greatest possible user experience at the lowest possible cost. That is a, a good way of looking at what they should do. Okay, so why am I mentioning this? Well, let's see if I can go to the next slide. Ah, because we are here proposing a, a new network call quality framework and do we really need it? Because there are a lot of network quality frameworks and why do we need a new one? Well, let me tell you a story about um, 
what we've been doing in our company. So we try to optimize Wi-Fi for application outcome, right? Making sure they work great. An application like Zoom we're using here. So we started looking at it and first we started, you know, looking at the most common uh, network metric megabits per second. And you quickly find out that you can have uh, two scenarios with equal bandwidth and very different user experience. And, you know, most of you guys here and girls are, are network people. So, you know, well, you have to look at latency well as well. So you start looking at latency and what you find out is that you can look at bandwidth and latency and still have uh, identical bandwidth and latency and different end user experience or application outcome. I mean, end user experience is a bit complicated, but let's, let's think of application outcome. So a, a Zoom call that is lagging or a Zoom call that is perfect, right? So some of you will be thinking, ah, oh, you're looking at average latency. You can't just look at average, you have to look at jitter as well. Well, we tried that as well. And you can have the same bandwidth, the same latency and the same jitter and assume call can still be good or bad, right? So uh, some of you will notice you, can, you have to look at packet loss as well. But even now, even if you add packet loss, jitter, latency and bandwidth, you still can have different things. You can still have the same applications with the same same network quality metrics and different end user experience. So our network quality metrics are inadequate to know if we are improving net user experience. And this matters a lot, right? Because this, the network quality metrics you're using are what, what you are using to justify uh, investments. It is what you're using to justify all sorts of things, right? So if, if we can't look at the network quality metrics we have today and tell if we're gonna have better application outcome, we need something new. And that's when we discover QED. And I, I will hand it over to Gavin now, uh, who will go more into detail about this. And at the end, I will actually, the last part of this, I will talk in much more detail about how we can uh, understand application outcome from the QED framework. So over to you, Gavin. Thanks, Magnus. Let me uh, just try and scroll down there. Uh, let's talk about the uh, QED framework and why, why we need a, a quality framework. Slide delay on the slides. Right. Um, so today we're actually living in the era of gigabit broadband. Uh, and I think now is the time for our industry to take the next step. So uh, in the early days of the broadband industry, all the focus has been on, you know, quantity of bandwidth uh, and and speed as a proxy for how good your, your broadband connection is. And then more recently, there's been quite a bit of work on the functionality of what you can do with that broadband connection and things like synchronization support. So maybe you can use it for small cell and mobile backhaul. But now we're in a, a position where, you know, particularly with the COVID lockdown, people are using their broadband connections for maybe 15 hours a day. Uh, and they're realizing that, you know, speed is not enough. There are other aspects of the quality of that connection uh, to do with latency and consistency, et cetera. Uh, and I guess, you know, none of us buy a car uh, purely based on the, the, the speed it goes, uh, yet the broadband industry has been a bit like that. It's quite, quite immature. Um, and, you know, it's possible to have a very fast car and a lousy ride experience. And, uh, and the same thing is true on broadband. You can have a, a great speed, um, but not necessarily a great application outcome. So if we try and summarize our broadband industry on one slide, um, th th this shows, you know, at the bottom on the left there, we uh, service providers, uh, network operators, we invest in our networks, we build capacity, bandwidth, you know, coverage. Uh, and then we hope that delivers application outcomes that uh, keep the customers happy. Uh, and today, the main way a, a customer assesses that is by running a speed test. Uh, and if that all works out, hopefully we get a good net pr promoter score. Uh, and on the top left there, you know, the, uh, we get, you know, uh, the opportunity to upsell and in increase the uh, engagement with that customer. But if we make a bit of a mess of that, then we get support calls or, or even worse, churn. 
Uh, and in the early days, there was a link between, you know, increase in bandwidth of the, the speed of that broadband connection, um, how well your applications work, like faster web page load time, um, the ability to watch, say, high definition instead of just sand, standard definition video. Um, there, there was quite a, you know, a decent coupling between those those layers there. But now we're in the gigabit era. Uh, that a coupling mechanism is is less certain and it's not just about speed so for customers on a gigabit uh, c connection today uh, and you upgrade them to two gigabit are they going to notice uh, much of a difference given today's applications and uh, obviously applications will evolve over to time but today that uh, we're in a law of diminishing returns in terms of the customer noticeable benefit of just increasing speed so the qed framework of the uh, broadband forum is looking holistically at this you know uh, uh, a challenge uh, and more specifically a technique called quality attenuation uh, looks at the network performance and the linkage to the application outcomes uh, and that particular uh, coupling mechanism. So if we look at the uh, fixed broadband digital supply chain today, uh, typically, you know, an, an end user may be connected to their broadband, typically via Wi-Fi, and then that hops across the network via access, backhaul, core, transit, etc., to get to an application server. Uh, and that's where they're using their broadband uh, connection to, to access that information. Uh, now today, you know, in engineering terms, we're quite familiar with the concept of uh, attenuation of electrical signals uh, and uh, indeed uh, attenuation of uh, optical signals and microwave signals that uh, uh, the longer uh, the, the distance, the, the weaker the signal and the lower the quality. Uh, and there's a, a bit of an analogy with uh, broadband networks at the packet layer that uh, as the networks from the application server traverse the network to get to the end user device, um, they, you know, all of those packets will be delayed. Um, they don't get there in zero time and some of those packets might be dropped. Um, and that can be for a, a variety of reasons, you know, Wi-Fi problems, capacity issues, etc., rerouting. Uh, but essentially, you know, there's an attenuation of the quality uh, of that delivery of packets compared to the perfect outcome, which would be zero delay and zero loss. And the gap between perfection and, and reality is that delta or that sometimes quality attenuation is abbreviated to delta Q is, is that comparison with the, the absolute uh, perfect outcome. Um, so today we, we have techniques to measure things like latency in networks, minimum, average, maximum, round trip time, uh, etc. Um, but really, you know, the quality attenuation technique enables us not just to look at uh, latency, but to look inside it and to understand the constituent components that make up that latency. And therefore, that gives us greater insights into how we can uh, improve the network performance and the uh, application outcomes for our customers. And you know, bandwidth is necessary, um, for example, to deliver, you know, ultra high definition 4K video stream, you might need 25, perhaps 30 megabits. So it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And certainly not all bandwidth is created equal. So, for example, 50 megabits on an empty network is not the same as 50 megabits on a loaded network because of the queuing and, and buffering that takes takes place as packets queue up in, uh, uh, in queues. And also 50 megabits on a 100 meg Ethernet port is not the same as 50 meg on a 10 gig port. There's a difference in serialization delay, the rate at which you clock packets in and out of the equipment. Uh, and, and for the same reason, a tenth of 100 megabit is not the same as uh, 10 megabits per second. Uh, and at the physical layer, different technologies, DOCSIS, fixed wireless access, uh, GPON, DSL, etc., they all have different characteristics. And so 50 meg on, on one technology is not necessarily going to give you the same uh, characteristics um, at, the, at the physical layer. Uh, and that can then ripple up to the packet layer and the patterns of, you know, pa packet loss and, uh, and, and delay, etc. So, you know, our industry has used bandwidth as, a, as a, a proxy for the goodness of an application outcome, but it's increasingly looking like it's, 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 uh, we need to do a better job. So if we compare the, the, the bandwidth model of the world that we've had so far, it, it's been a, a simple number, uh, megabits, gigabits per second, uh, the bigger, the better. So that's understood by customers. You know, my broadband's faster than yours, so it must be better. And the logical extension of that model to perfection is infinite bandwidth. Whereas with the quality model, it's uh, a little bit more to get your head around. It's uh, an entry pool. It's got multiple elements to it. It could be packet loss, latency, reliability, etc. Uh, and until now, there hasn't been a, a widely agreed definition or certainly a standard uh, uh, that covers some of those aspects. 
Um, but the logical extension of, of that model is zero defects, as we used to in the manufacturing industries. But in this case, it's zero packet loss and delay. Uh, and from an engineering perspective, it's a lot easier to measure how close you are to zero than how close you are to infinity. Okay, with that point, I shall hand over to uh, Peter. Hello. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to say a bit more about uh, why broadband speed is not enough. Uh, and I'm going to say a bit, bit more, in a little bit more detail the, the, the explanation of what quality attenuation is, um, which will help uh, frame some of the other uh, presentations that we're going to give uh, this afternoon. So, okay, uh, just following on uh, from what's been said already, the question is, is you know, when is enough not enough? Um, we know applications need enough capacity, um, but uh, this may not be enough to enable them to work well. And um, just by an analogy, think about delivering a cargo of eggs. Um, so we have to ask, first of all, is the, is the truck we have to deliver all these eggs big enough? Clearly, if it's not big enough, we're not going to succeed in delivering the eggs. Um, but that's not the only question. We can ask, will the eggs still be fresh when they arrive? If this lorry is going to take a, you know, a big detour and, and uh, take a week to get to where it's going, um, that may not be very good for the quality of the produce. We may want to know how many eggs are going to get broken on the way. So an analogy in delivering a cargo of packets is, is the capacity big enough? Obviously, that's a, that's a key question. Um, but we, in this era of gigabit broadband, generally speaking, the capacity is big enough. So we need to look at more questions. Will the packets have too much delay? And uh, we'll get into some discussion of what, what too much means here. Um, but that's clearly an important question. And how many are going to be lost? So, so we, need to, we need to consider these additional factors. So the focus of the, uh, the quality experience delivered program is on quality rather than quantity, not because quantity isn't important, but because the industry has done a, such a fantastic job of pretty much solving that problem already. Broadband is pretty good now. Uh, lots of packets get delivered quickly. So usually it's fine on average, um, but actually it's the, it's the rare exceptions which make the difference. Um, rare as in kind of one in a hundred or one in a thousand. Um, applications, depending on what they are and what they're doing, can be very sensitive to those. So we need to measure the delta away from perfection. Um, uh, this thing we call quality attenuation, and uh, we sometimes write it here using uh, the Greek letter delta for a difference delta Q. And we change the focus from having more capacity to delivering less attenuation. Okay, so I'm going to say a bit about it, the, the, all the details of exactly how this is defined and so forth is going to be in the uh, uh, second part of this, of this series, the subsequent webinar. Uh, but these are some important things to, to, to know about it. So a key thing is that it accumulates from source to destination. Um, so this is, this is rather like um, uh, noise in an electrical system. Once, once noise has got in, you can't get it out again. Noise accumulates. Um, and Delta Q accumulates, but Delta Q accumulates as the, the stream of packets goes across the network. Um, and this actually uh, makes this a very helpful measure from, from the point of view of localizing performance issues. Um, uh, because you can, you, can, you can track where the, the quality attenuation accumulates and say, ah, this is, this is probably where we have an issue. Um, it combines delay and loss into a single measure. And this is, this is a subtle but important point. Um, quite often, uh, we may have a big focus on, on, uh, on latency and there's uh, various new technologies, 5G and so forth, which, which uh, you know, uh, a lot of engineering effort has gone into reducing latency and so forth. Um, and then packet loss is kind of a separate thing. Um, but actually, from the point of view of an application, these are kind of the same thing. Um, a packet that is delayed too much is as good as lost. Um, so really, it doesn't make sense to think of these as, as completely separate measures. We need to combine them. So this is how Delta Q cap captures how applications see the network. It, it's, it's a bridge between the network and the application worlds. From the point of view of the application, the network is just uh, you know, a bit of a nuisance uh, because, because it delays some of its packets and sometimes it loses them. Um, 
uh, obviously the application benefits hugely from 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 having uh, different components separated, but um, the network is 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 uh, an impedance for it. So the next thing I want to talk about is delta Q is a distribution. Um, we saw before where we looked at things like bandwidth. Bandwidth is easy to understand because we can characterize it with uh, typically a single number. Um, but all averages lose information. Um, and uh, so uh, what we're going to do with, with delta Q is we're going to keep the whole distribution of delay and loss. So we get, we're, what we're interested in is not just um, how many packets, uh, how long packets take to arrive on average, but um, how long it takes 90% of them to arrive, how long it takes 95% of them to arrive. These are, these are um, important considerations for, for the application. Because applications are sensitive to different aspects of this. Um, um, but once we have a distribution, we can extract everything we want. Obviously, we can find the average. Um, we can, I don't know what happened there. Um, we can, uh, we can find, you know, what happened to the last 1%. Uh, all of that information is present. And it also enables us to have a definition of what is good enough. And this is very important from an engineering perspective. Um, we, can, we can define something that we call a quantitative timeliness agreement. And I'm gonna go into this in detail here. Um, but what we can say is, um, we can say that uh, provided quality attenuation is low enough, the application will be happy. And then we can measure what it is and see whether it's, it is low enough. So if we, if we use something called a cumulative distribution function, um, where uh, on the bottom here, we have the response time in whatever the units are, might well be milliseconds. Um, and on the left, we have what fraction of the packets have arrived within that time. Then the blue, the blue line here is a specification of what's good enough, right? We're saying 50% of the packets have to arrive within five units, 95% um, have to arrive within 10 units, and um, 99% have to arrive within 15 units. And maybe we're happy for 1% for, uh, to be lost. And then the black curve is what we were actually delivering. And provided the black curve is, is to the left and above of the blue curve, we're always doing better than we needed to do. And actually now we can say the delivery is good enough for this application's requirements. So the way we do this kind of measurement, again, I'm not going to go into all the details, but we can we can we can figure this out by just by passing some some uh, test packets through the network and measuring the times at which they pass various points. Um, and we can do this with a, with a low rate of packets. It doesn't consume much of the capacity, but by collecting all this information and analyzing it, we can find out um, the, the distribution of delay and loss. Um, on the round trip and in each direction. And this gives us a lot of information that we can play with. And then we can, we can uh, take this information and we can decompose it into some, some uh, useful uh, separate components. Um, obviously longer packets take longer to send than short ones do. And we can, we can factor that out. We can, we can uh, uh, account for the serialization delay. We can look, look, look at what's the absolute minimum time that anything can take. And that tells us a lot about the route the packets are taking and, and various aspects of the technology that's, that's uh, transmitting them. And what's left, which we call the variable or V component, um, is then telling us a lot about um, uh, the congestion and the, and the queuing that's going on in the network. And, and by, by separating, separating out these separate components, um, we can get a lot of insight into, into uh, the structure and performance of the network, which is really helpful for uh, targeting investment and troubleshooting problems. And all for, there's a lot more details of this in the Broadband Forum technical report. Um, and uh, also there'll be more on this in the, in the, uh, the follow-on webinar. Okay. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, how we can use this for uh, isolating some performance issues. And I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to talk about um, why this is difficult. So, so why is it difficult to isolate performance faults in networks particularly? Um, so part of the problem is, is the digital delivery chains cross multiple management domains. Uh, either these could be interior silos within an operator, there may be different divisions that are responsible for the core network from the access part and so forth. Um, 
but we may also be using uh, third parties for uh, some of the connections, particularly uh, access tails when they're, when they're off net. Um, and of course, we, on the other side, we have the internet. And there's, there's currently no way of managing performance across these boundaries. Typical uh, SLAs, even where they exist, are far too weak. They all talk about averages, um, and they're typically averages over very long timescales, which tell you really nothing about what might be happening on a, on a second by second basis that would affect an application. And it's difficult to locate any performance issues, uh, partly because they're frequently, these are things which are rare or intermittent. So again, if you're only capturing averages, um, it gets very difficult to even see them. Um, and it may also be due to some kind of mismatch, which isn't anybody's fault, but, but actually relates to the fact that the, that the, uh, the SLA is really aren't, aren't, aren't uh, fit for purpose. So I'm going to run through a little case study. Um, uh, this is something that PNSOL did a little while ago. Um, uh, the situation was this. Uh, there was a tier one mobile network operator who was deploying um, 3G small cells, um, which are really intended for delivering um, uh, you know, improved coverage, rock solid service, particularly for major corporate customers. And this is a system which had been successfully deployed on a, on a medium scale for a supporting event um, uh, using uh, Ethernet connectivity, tying everything together. But now they were using uh, a wholesale broadband backwall um, with bandwidth which is entirely adequate. You can measure the, the, the bandwidth that the system requires and you can check that, that you know, the, the, the access links um, that, you're, that you're buying are um, more than fast enough, and, and that, that should be fine. However, they were having problems. Uh, the voice quality was typically not good, and sometimes the small cells would fail altogether. And this was, this was quite a problem, and the, the MNO was blaming the wholesale backhaul supplier. It was, it was starting to turn a bit ugly, um, and we were brought in to try and identify what was the underlying root cause of these issues. So this is how we did it. Um, so on the top here, we have the, the uh, delivery chain. Um, and you can see in green here, little, little observation points. And these are, these are the, the, the points where we were looking to um, uh, collect timing information about packets going across the system. Uh, so we used a, a synthetic traffic generator that uh, uh, sent all the data, all the packets to a reference point, um, uh, which turns the packets back and uh, you know, sends them around so we get a we can get a round trip measurement um, uh, and then we have internal observers that give us more spatial information about where things are happening so the packets go out and back and we observe them all these intermediate points and each observation point doubles the resolution so even with just the the beginning and end of this chain we can see whether the issue is a, an upstream or a downstream issue and then what we did was to take measurements while inducing a failure, which turned out to be caused by correlated end user action. Basically, we had a bucket full of mobile phones and, and handed them out. Everybody made a call at the same time. OK, so we can ask the question, why is the system failing? Um, so we have here uh, the kind of, if you like, the raw quality attenuation, attenuation measurements. Each of these little red dots is, is a delay of a packet um, uh, over time. Um, and you can see that uh, the, the, the delay varies in time, um, uh, but you can see uh, it gets much bigger in the downstream direction than it did in the upstream. So that looks like that's where the problem is. So if we look just at the downstream direction, we can use these additional observation points that we put in to isolate the problem to whose management domain is it in. So uh, basically with, with the magic of QED, we can, we can pull out um, the effect of different parts of the delivery chain and we can see that while there's quite a lot of delay variability in the in the national interconnect here um, it's not that large and it's not the thing that's causing the problem when we look at the wholesale access core so this is the 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 part that's in the domain of the of the wholesale broadband provider um, we can see uh, there's the problem it's that big spike of delay and that is occurring in in, in their part of the network okay so far so good um, uh, at this point, we could have just uh, kind of uh, left the investigation and said, there you are, it is their fault. Um, but actually, there's a, there is more to it, and we can find out more using QED in more detail. 
So if we look at, uh, if we look at the, uh, what's going on here in, in more detail with, with in, in terms of time, so we stretch that time out, um, you can see these uh, peaks, particularly the big one in the middle, um, the delay at a certain point goes up really fast and then it drops off more slowly. And, and our experience tells us that that's a typical um, pattern when a queue is being overdriven. Um, so, okay, that's probably what's going on. So another of the things about Delta Q is that it's, it's uh, predictable. You can, you can calculate what it's gonna be in, in circumstances where you know what's going on. So here's the measure delay we were just seeing. And then here was the delay we calculated uh, using a simple queuing model based on the observations of the traffic which, are, which is leaving the MNO security gateway. So, okay, the diagnosis is there's a queue forming and it's because although the bandwidth, remember bandwidth is an average, the bandwidth is, is sufficient, um, there's an instantaneous burst that comes in um, which exceeds the service capacity of the, of the line. Um, so, Technically, it's in breach of the, of the uh, wholesale provider's uh, terms and conditions. So maybe it isn't their fault. Um, why is this a problem? The queue delays all the traffic, which includes the control traffic for the small cells. And basically, um, if, they, if, they, if they don't get control sufficiently often, they, they basically give up, um, basically because they can't keep their clocks in sync. And if they can't keep clocks in sync, they can't guarantee they're in the right frequency band, and that's all licensed, and that's a problem. So they have to, they have to turn themselves off. But that's just the extreme case. Um, these bursts of delay were, were also affecting the voice quality, and it also causes the small cells to to uh, to reduce their transmission and and uh, breathe in um, and reduce the coverage and and really not do the things that they were supposed to be doing commercially. Okay, so conclusion: the root cause of the problem was completely obscured by averages. Bandwidth was was adequate. Actually, if you'd taken averages of latency, that would have looked fine also. Using the QED approach gives us a high resolution view and it gives us a, a resolution in time so we can see these rare events and it gives a resolution in space so we can isolate where the issue occurs. Okay, I lost control of the slides just there. Okay, right, sorry. And suddenly caught up. Let me just uh, back up a moment. So this is the case in point. If we had QED on these networks, we could avoid these kind of problems. Uh, okay, well, I'm basically now I'm going to hand over to uh, Gavin and see if he can control his slides better than I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so let's look now at uh, the potential role of quality attenuation at different phases in the life cycle. And, and typically when we talk about a, a measurement or a, an analysis um, technique like this, we might be thinking of uh, the in-life management, you know, what happens when things are deployed and identifying root cause. And certainly it can be used in, in that context. But you can also use this at the start of the life cycle. Um, I don't know if Tiffany even get the slides back. Um, uh, so at the start of the life cycle, when you're considering architectures, con comparing technologies, doing feasibility analysis, etc., uh, and trying to you know, understand how these technologies can compare. Um, so you can use this in a, a design and a, a lab environment. Um, so, for example, you might want to uh, emulate the different degrees of quality attenuation of, of a network uh, instead of going to the expense of trials. Um, and that's something that's uh, possible. You can uh, emulate the, 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 the varying degrees of packet loss and delay separately for upstream and downstream. And effectively, you could measure that in a live network and then play it back and control it in a lab environment. Um, I don't know, Tiff, have we got the slides there? I seem to have lost those for the moment. Yeah, bear with us. We've, we've just had a technical difficulty, okay. so I will... I will actually try to share screen um, yeah. and try to remember exactly which slide we were on there, Gavin. <laughs> okay, on the on the live cycle one, but I'll, I'll keep going anyway. We can skip over, and, and the slides will be available afterwards, so you'd be able to uh, uh, 
um, look through those at your leisure. So you can you can basically emulate the quality attenuation in a, in a lab environment, uh, a much more controlled environment, uh, and that enables you, for example, to look at the impact of different network conditions. Uh, on, on an application uh, performance, and you could um, vary those conditions and, and understand under which you know conditions uh, things might break. Uh, okay, need to roll forward a bit on the slides there, Craig. Tiffany is back and is oh, sharing okay. with you, Gavin. So. Okay, right. Okay, great. Okay, so here we are. We're talking about the front end of the life cycle. Um, uh, let's skip past that. Um, so this is what I'm, I'm talking about here. So uh, an application client and server and then varying the, the, the network in, in the middle and, and uh, assessing the outcomes. Uh, you can also take that one stage uh, further with, uh, right, slides are not moving, uh, with kind of A-B testing where you um, compare side by side two different setups. Uh, and and for example, configure the um, your network uh, under you know for a given load condition, have different network conditions, and, and see how that implica uh, impacts the application outcome. Okay, uh, and then th there's a whole bunch of other design and lab evaluation use cases. So beyond de-risking application deployment, we've talked about there. Uh, you can measure the cost benefit of where you put your multi-access edge compute. You know, do you want that at the uh, uh, the edge of your network near your access node in your own private cloud or in a public cloud or, or extreme case on the enterprise customer's premises, for example, uh, and un understanding how the, the quality attenuation varies and having measured that, then, then you can, again, play that back through you know, different scenarios and in a controlled environment. Um, you can you know, use it to optimize speed tests, to compare um, and benchmark the performance of equipment, whether that's physical equipment or virtual network functions, uh, test out different uh, network configurations uh, and see how that uh, affects the quality attenuation, etc. Uh, and finally, you know, as input to your network architecture and design at the front end of the life cycle. So where do you want to locate a particular virtualized network function or containerized function in the network and how might that perform? Uh, and if you would like more detail on some of those kind of use cases, then there is a, a new broadband forum uh, marketing document, uh, MR452.4, which, which covers some of these lab evaluation and network design scenarios in, in a little bit more detail. And, and that's publicly available on the uh, PBF website. Okay, over to Rudy. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gavin. So uh, bringing, bringing forward the the value of QED for service providers. Uh, one of the highlights that uh, Aspirant uh, is really monitoring here at the Broadband Forum is, is how we can uh, utilize QED beyond what TWAMP has been for service providers uh, to date. Uh, one of the values we see is that the network quality is moving over to a measurable quality of service where we're able to do an end-to-end -end QoS for all types of networks, which would be mobile enterprise for business uh, enterprise and residential drops. Uh, one of the other highlights of uh, QED is, is, the three, is the measuring components of it with Delta Q tools that go beyond just the latency on the network. Uh, what, we, what we see of value is that we can now break down the influencers of what latency uh, is occurring on the network. And then with the segmentation capabilities, not just with the local access, the core, or the internet component. We're also, as Peter highlighted, able to break it down to the Delta Q uh, G, S, and B components, which are the geographical, the interface packet size, and the queuing uh, buffering that's occurring on the network. Uh, all of these are, are uh, all contributing to why uh, Spirant is uh, looking to, to see how this is adopted by the industry. I'm trying to keep moving forward. Let's see if it uh, moves the screen here. Tiffany, I might be having the same problem. Oh, if I can go back one. Okay, and so as as I I take a re replay back the the value of QED as as Gavin was highlighting. Uh, on either of these networks, whether it be a mobile or an enterprise residential, the ability to set the application QTAs 
for customer service uh, applications uh, is going to start to become a different differentiator uh, for these type of uh, for any service provider. Uh, being able to meet, uh, especially now in, in the era of COVID, uh, the video uh, for for virtual uh, conferencing, uh, the gaming industry, whether it's uh, land based, right, for residential drops or uh, over 4G, 5G connections. How is applic How are the QTAs? Uh, performing, or I should say, how is the network measured with QED with Delta Q performing relative to the QTA? Another aspect of the uh, Delta Q tools is going to enable the service providers also to manage their leased access lines. Uh, in many cases, uh, in terms of the delivery chain, you have leasing uh, agreements, contracts, and in today's world, uh, those are very simply three or four classes of service that are offered by service providers uh, at different points of the, of the delivery chain. Now with QTAs, uh, you're able to set the SLAs and be able to monitor those on a monthly basis to be able to identify performance and potentially for service providers, be able to drive accountability, but more, uh, which is most important, but also be able to have uh, the backing data for uh, for rebates and and, uh, and 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 claiming penalties. Again, the segmentation of the tool, uh, as Peter was identifying, you can put it at different aspects, whether it be the local drop or the uh, the the transport core. Uh, you can start to, uh, for a service provider, being able to dig into that level of troubleshooting starts to become. Uh, uh, and also another uh, benefit. Uh, lastly, in terms of the uh, the tool, the Delta Q agent itself, uh, Spiron's very interested in being able to add it into our VisionWorks library, where today we have other agents that are uh, industry standard, just like your TWAMP, uh, the uh, 6540, uh, 6534, uh, all types of different tests that we have in our, our VisionWorks platform can be pulled and added to a section of the network. And so the idea here is that having a customer, a service provider's inventory of infrastructure, the physical, with the logical assignments that go across and what they should be delivering uh, from that back office via APIs, that allows us to be able to then at the initial lifecycle do a service activation test and then switch that over to a monitoring set of agents. And then if there is trouble that's reported, we're able to kick off the, the ability to do the trouble isolation. And all this ultimately, ideally for service providers should be automated such that we don't have to go into the hand holding of troubleshooting as, as Peter identified earlier, right? With that specific situation, all of this is being monitored real time for the purpose of making sure that we're meeting our QTAs. And with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll hand it back over. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm control of the slides here. Come in just a moment. Um, okay, so we're going to run through another little um, case study now, um, relating to the uh, actually more to the sort of stuff that Gavin was talking about, um, uh, using this in a in a, uh, a a troubleshooting environment, but 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 in in relation to uh, even a, a single operator's network. Make the slide advance. Okay, right. So I'm going to here look at the uh, um, using this for performance optimization. Uh, so we've we've uh, we've talked a lot about how um, uh, speed is no longer a good proxy, but actually um, the broadband industry has been focused for a long time on uh, improving throughput, and for many years this was the primary constraint on user experience. Um, uh, people can remember back to the old days when uh, you know you had a you had a a one megabit connection, a two megabit connection really was twice as good. Um, but now we have gigabit broadband and gigabit broadband is, is, is certainly enough for most applications we have around for the time being. 
Um, and user experience is being constrained by other factors, and that's the focus of QED. Uh, but in the meantime, end users and regulators have been conditioned into thinking about broadband speed, um, typically measured using a speed test app such as, such as Ookla. Um, and speed tests basically transfer a block of data using, using TCP, typically multiple TCP streams, and they time how long it takes. Um, and uh, for all we may be pushing the agenda that uh, uh, speed is not enough, we need to think about other things. Uh, this is still a very important measure um, uh, in many areas and the criteria by which service providers are judged and so forth. So we can't ignore it. But the speed test is a very specialized application. It's not very representative of uh, most of the things that um, uh, users use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so the question becomes, can we, can we afford to optimize it without damaging other application uh, performance at the same time? And this is, this is a relevant question. A lot of the things that have been done uh, over time to um, improve throughput sometimes are at the expense of, of um, pessimizing about other aspects. For example, on, on uh, DSL technology, um, you can introduce interleaving to improve throughput, but interleaving also adds more delay. So, so uh, there's always a trade-off here and, and we need to try and be careful about uh, how we're using it. Okay, so specifically, what was the customer problem? Um, we had a tier one network operator delivering uh, gigabit uh, FTTP and FTTH services. Um, and in some areas they were using their own uh, GPON access tails and everything was fine. Uh, in other locations, they were using a third party access network and there the end users were frequently not getting the speed test results that they expected. Um, and uh, you know, getting a good speed test result was actually part of the, of the contract with the, with the customer. And so that had an impact on their revenue and also wasn't doing the reputation any good. The other curious thing is that other ISPs using the same third party access did get the expected speed test results. So, okay, just play this again. The operator using their own access tells everything is good. Other people using the third party access, it's all good. When they use the third party access, it's not good. And substantial efforts by skilled professionals have failed to solve this. So we brought in QED. So what do we do? We measured the baseline delta Q when there was no load, just to look for uh, odd features and expected variation. Um, you know, is there anything peculiar here that, that, would, that would indicate a problem? Secondly, measure it when it is under load. Um, we used a tool called iPerf. Um, uh, to, it's, a, it's a simpler kind of speed test. It's less complex and easier to control. Um, measure the delays while that's going on, and also count the TCP retries, which is a, a measure of the of the uh, the loss which has been introduced by the, the congestion uh, that, that TCP inevitably introduces. And then isolate the loss and delay issues. Where do they occur? Why do they occur? And what can the operator do to address them? Okay, so this is the kind of setup we use for the baseline delta Q measurements. Um, so on the right, there's the operator network. Obviously there's more to it I haven't shown, but we have a probe attached to the, uh, the broadband network gateway, which then crosses into the third party network domain, um, connects to the OLT, across their access network to the ONT uh, on the customer premises where we have an edge probe. And we, in a similar pattern to we've seen before, exchange test packets between the central probe and the edge probe and measure the delta Q. And here's the kind of results we get. Um, uh, this is just a graph again of, of, uh, of individual delta Q measurements over time. And you can see the, the delay is, is low and stable and there's no loss. So this is looking pretty good. So in order to uh, expand this setup to measure the, uh, the performance under load, we do an iPerf test, we send traffic up and then we send traffic to, uh, transfer data down uh, all the time measuring the delta Q. So what happens? So this is the kind of thing that happens. So uh, you can see in the first part, there's uh, what happens. Uh, this is the round trip delay. It's what happens to the, the uh, delay when we do the upload test? Um, the delay goes up and down a bit, which is what you expect to happen with TCP. And then we start the download test um, and the delay rises, but then it suddenly drops again. Um, and it keeps doing this and the TCP stream never achieves the full line rate. And the interesting thing to note is that the height of these spikes is 18 milliseconds, which at a gigabit a second 
is uh, pretty not pretty spot on two megabytes. That's going to be uh, important later. So, okay, now there's the, having got that information, um, there's an investigation. What do we do? So, what do we observe? First of all, we see we would expect TCP throughput should rise until the buffer gets full at the BNG, and then it should settle down to a stable oscillation um, with the the whole path being kept non-empty. That's the that's that's what TCP is aiming to do. It's trying to make sure there's something in flight all the time. Um, and that maximizes the, the throughput given the, the capacity. But we don't see that. We see loss, which causes the TCP throughput to drop severely. But looking at the counters in the BNG, which is obviously under the, in the operator's domain, uh, they can see there was no loss happening there. So loss is happening somewhere else uh, and probably where, where there's a two megabyte buffer. So what are the likely causes? So one could be a mismatch rate setting between the BNG and the OLT. So the BNG thinks it's, it's, it's sending out a gigabit, but the OLT thinks this is more than a gigabit. It depends on the precise definition of a gigabit. Uh, and that depends which parts of the framing and headers all count. And the other thing that could be going on is that uh, although the rate is fine on average, we get bursts from the BNG, which are too big, which causes loss in the OLT buffer. So looking at this question of how much is a gigabit is what we see with the, uh, uh, the format of, of data on the wire, um, the, the bit highlighted here with, uh, with orange is the uh, IP protocol data unit. Um, the green bit is the, user, the user's data, the bit the application actually wants. Um, and then we have other bits of overhead that get attached to it. Um, and if we're, if we're clocking data at a gigabit per second on the wire, um, uh, you, you can do the calculations and you can only get um, just under 934 megabits per second of the user data. So that's the maximum rate you should expect to see. So what did we do to test this hypothesis? So what we tried was we, we inserted a, a, uh, a, a special component, which we call a QTA MUX um, uh, into the traffic path. And this is a, a um, traffic scheduling component, which is based on, on the QED principles. Uh, so it shapes the traffic accounting for all the framing overheads and it uh, smooths out the bursts. Basically, it's, it's managing to, to loss and delay rather than worrying uh, too precisely about throughput. And the result was perfect performance. The speed test reports uh, 933 megabits per second, and this was that without changing anything else. So this is not a, a commercial product that the, that the operator can use. Um, so we need to develop a solution using the available BNG parameters. Um, we can fiddle with things like frame offsets, maximum burst size, queue visitation times, um, uh, seeking to achieve the same effect as we got with the QTA MUX. Basically using the, the QTA MUX demonstrated that it's a, it's a, a traffic arrival pattern problem. Um, uh, quite similar in fact to the, to the, uh, the, the first example that I talked about. Um, so we need to deal with, with uh, the right offsets, the right framing calculations, but also manage the bursts. So here were some experiments done with, uh, with the burst size. You can see as the burst size was varied, this was done in, in, a, in the operator's lab. Um, beyond a certain point, the TCP good, but suddenly, suddenly drops away. Um, and that tells us there's, there's a, you know, a maximum size of burst that can be, that can be allowed through uh, to the OLT. So we did all this tuning um, and uh, repeated the delta Q measurements and you see um, the IPERF upload is pretty much the same as before. And the download now, we, we don't see these, these big spikes and drops. We have uh, some oscillation up and down, which is what, what TCP will do. But basically the delay stabilizes um, at uh, a value which is a little bit higher than before. Previously it, 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 it cut off at 18 milliseconds. Now it gets up to 20 milliseconds, and that's actually enough in, in this uh, setup for the TCP to achieve maximum throughput. So just to summarize, using QAT, QED revealed a what we call a QTA mismatch, um, a, a, uh, uh, a, a real-time SLA uh, disagreement across a management domain boundary. Um, and uh, the, the, the takeaway here is it's essential to constrain the delivered load profile in order to ex obtain acceptable delta Q. That's basically what a QTA is. It says 
if the load is, is held within these bounds, then the quality attenuation will be no worse than, than this. Um, uh, and although no one had agreed us uh, an explicit contract like that, implicitly, this is what the machinery was all doing. Okay, fixing this brought the speed test results in line with the configured rates, uh, and it did it without introducing extra buffering or delay. Um, so, good news, it also made end user experience applications more snappy. This is what one of the uh, uh, users uh, with one of the, uh, the, um, uh, the customer, customer uh, premise probes in reported. Uh, so we have a happy coexistence of speed test and other applications. Um, it's a good result. Okay, I will hand back to Gavin. Thanks, Peter. Okay, let's see if we can click that slide forward. Right, let's look at uh, quality attenuation in action then. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, let's uh, skip through these pretty quickly. So the number of observable phenomena using quality attenuation, um, uh, changes in the network such as you know rerouting, load balancing, packet fragmentation, uh, impacts, misconfigured schedulers. We, we've um, uh, had the techniques successfully used to identify problems there, either in the network or with, or with uh, uh, vendor uh, uh, designs even, uh, and implementations. Um, so a, a range of different uh, phenomena that you can see there. Um, and one of the other things we, we've done is used it to characterize different uh, broadband technologies. And uh, I, I won't go into the detail of the, the V, S and the G components here. That's something that the next webinar will explain in more detail. Um, but basically we were able to compare BDSL, GPON, 4G and understand the different components and how they vary uh, and, and therefore, you know, uh, get a feel for what those um, different technologies might be doing to, uh, uh, to the applications experience or certainly the, the network performance. Um, and another uh, thing you can use it for is to compare different configurations of equipment. So here we've got two different uh, fibers of the home GPON uh, LTs uh, from the same vendor, but with different uh, configurations and set up in two different uh, live networks. Uh, and you can see the uh, the configuration for the one on the right, it, it, the scheduler is trying to hold the overall latency kind of more, more, more flat and more stable compared to the configuration on the left. Uh, and understanding these, these uh, impacts of your configurations can be important for applications and, and use cases. So if you're trying to deliver uh, sync packets for say small cell connectivity or enterprise services with tight SLAs, or maybe you know future more onerous applications with AR and VR, these kind of things might become important uh, uh, to, to understand. Uh, and here's an example where we can separate out the different latency components using the quality attenuation. And here we're just looking at the, the variable component that is due to scheduling and the impact of load on the network and, and looking separately at the upstream and downstream. Uh, and this is from a, a connection, one of my uh, colleagues lines where it was on a, a five time GPON connection, completely fl flooded the uh, traffic in this test setup. Uh, and then we turned on quads uh, in both directions. It's a bit of a crude <laughs> uh, illustration, but it illustrates the point. You can see the benefits and the lower latency and the, and the smoothness of that uh, improvement in, in turn on the quad scheduler. So hopefully this just gives you some, some quick insights uh, in, in, you know, in the interest of time, I'll whiz through those, but uh, give you some insights in, into how you can use it. Okay, back to Magnus. Perfect, can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> I know there's no one answering. So, okay, so 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 why do we care? And um, uh, and you know, there's been a lot of talk about QTAs, uh, and I'll go a bit more into detail about that. But first, let's start with a question: Why is it why is it so difficult to map network quality to user experience? Well, it's because it depends on the application. And like someone said here, like applications, they change uh, quite frequently, actually. Uh, but we can still distill it down to say a set of types of application and, and how they react. And what um, network quality dimension that makes them fail, right? For interactive applications like Zoom calls, if someone is answering me, um, latency and jitter 
uh, reliability of packet loss is important, right? There are also video conferencing solutions that has some hidden buffering, which kind of changes the most important dimension in network quality. There's more stability that is important. And, you know, download driven application have a throughput uh, as the most important dimension and website latencies, right? You want, you want that snappiness at, at uh, page load time, right? Um, for someone that does network optimization, this makes lives really hard, right? Because uh, a lot of uh, things I can do when I optimize a network is a trade-off between, for example, throughput and latency, right? So if, if I'm increasing throughput with 50% and also increasing latency with 20%, Am I making it better for the end user? Well, that depends, right? What kind of uh, applications you are using. Okay. So what's so great about the QD framework? One of the things that's great about it is that you can, you can start mapping these, um, these QTAs to, to network quality. So like, has been mentioned here is that you can look at, at uh, network quality uh, as a distribution uh, of latency, right? And you can look at that at a given load. So also in the framework are these QTAs, which let you say, like I'll do the video conferencing example. It takes about four megabits per second load. So you set four megabits per second load. And then you say, hey, I need 50% of my packets to arrive within 50 milliseconds, 99% of the packets to arrive within 100 milliseconds. And then that, that allows for 1% packet loss. The thing is, you can start, you can start there and they can, then you can make more and more complex application requirements. And the thing is like, we have a road to perfection here. I'm not saying we'll ever get there, but it's, we have a way of getting better and better and better at creating these QTAs. So we, we have some examples here uh, that we have developed. And <laughs> I won't go into details because we are out of time. But here's just a set of examples and the slides will be available later that you can, you can make these QTAs for different kinds of application and you can make them better and better. And you can have multiple... Like we know, uh, applications like Zoom, like Netflix, they have multiple levels of quality. So you can have multiple QTAs, right? And this all goes into the same framework. And it gives me the possibility of saying, hey, you know, I know this, this connection and I know the quality attenuation of this connection. That means I can actually give you a likelihood of an application working. So I can give you a likelihood of video conferencing working and I can give you a likelihood of video streaming working, right? And that means we can also uh, do stuff like say, you know, I want this connection to be able to support two simultaneous video streaming and two simultaneous video conferencing, right? And then I can optimize the network, set the configuration so that that is what you're getting. Right? Instead of, you know, the old, just optimizing for bandwidth. That was me. Great. Thank you, Magnus, and all of our panelists. Uh, greatly appreciate that. Um, we have slightly overrun, um, and I would like to thank the panelists, actually, for answering nearly the vast majority of questions in the Q&A already. Um, so um, luckily, um, thank you very much for saving us that time in the Q&A. We will make those answers available to everyone in our post email details. And I'd also like to ask the panelists to look at any unanswered questions and see if you can answer those um, after this event so that we can publish it, that in, in the email itself too. Uh, but in the interest of time as we've overrun, I am... Um, I won't go through a active and live Q&A section. Um, there's been some great questions and some great answers in regards to what's changed in regards to Delta Qs uh, since our uh, last publications of the data. And obviously its availability is an open standard. 
uh, how to deploy, et cetera. There's been some great questions and answers, but I won't go into any further details. We will supply that later on in the post-event email to you. Um, so really just looking at that at the final slide, um, uh, this is one of um, <laughs> Gavin's fantastic ones. I'm not sure if it would have fallen off uh, the tongue quite as well as I feel the need for speed, but uh, what QED is doing as an open standard available to everybody in the industry, members or non-members, is that uh, we feel the need for consistent and manageable latency. And just as a direction for uh, a follow-up, when we're going to go into a much more technical deep dive of QED and all the interworking, that is proposed now for Wednesday, the 3rd of March. Um, we will send up a registration and email to you to register. If that's of interest to you or any of your colleagues, please do join us for the second of these QED webinars on Wednesday, the 3rd of March. So all that's left to me now is to thank our panelists. They did a great job. Thank you very, very much. And we look forward to seeing you on our second QED deep dive webinar. Take care and thanks for joining. <laughs>